So if you'll find your seat, take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 4. In a few minutes we're going to read, begin reading in verse 23 of Matthew chapter 4 and then read the first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 5. Today, uh, as we start this new series on the Sermon on the Mount, the next several weeks, this uh, as the fall comes on, we'll be covering Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Some great teaching here. So, hope you'll read ahead. And if you have any resources on uh, the Sermon on the Mount, read those and be prepared as we study together and receive what the Lord has for us uh, in this teaching. Let me set a little background here as to the context and where we are in the life of the Lord Jesus. And it is a there is a connection between the Ten Command or the, yes, the Ten Commandments that we finished that series on those laws and the Sermon on the Mount, and we'll see the connection this morning because we have to ask the question as we approach the ten, uh, the Sermon on the Mount: Is this uh, a legal document? Is this a legal treatise here that the Lord is teaching now and? We'll address that this morning, but first as we approach this, um, this great sermon, what we see here in, Gospels Matthew, uh, in Matthew's Gospel is Matthew is just drawing open, if you will, the curtains of the early years of the first century. And as he draws open these curtains, we see God the Son has stepped on the stage of history. And somewhere around age 30, Jesus has, he, he began his public ministry and taught publicly for about three years before he went to the cross. So it's a narrow window of public ministry. But we're getting, as we pick up the text this morning, we're getting the, a glimpse of the beginning of the Lord's public ministry. He's approaching of the age of 30 and he stepped on to the stage here in his public ministry right in the midst of this great cultural and spiritual religious revolution that was influenced greatly by the Greco-Roman culture of course and, and then the great culture religious culture of the Jews that was dominated mostly by the Pharisees. And the Pharisees played a significant role during this period of time in Jesus' life and in his teaching. They were the religious, we could call them the religious superstars of the day. They believed that the true religion consisted of divine laws and religious traditions. In other words, they took the Ten Commandments that we have studied and then over the years and the centuries, the rabbis came and added particular traditions and more laws to those laws uh, and got to the finer points of the law. And they were very strict traditions that the Jews had to observe according to the rabbinic teachings. And these strict traditions had been handed down over the years by the rabbis and by the time Jesus steps on the stage and he begins this very fresh sermon, the Pharisees had put the bar of religion so high that the average person really felt like he couldn't compete. And it, it, it was, it, in really, we see that in a negative way, that the Phariseeism had grown to this point by the time Jesus steps on the stage. And yet, there's a positive side to it. Because the people, even the Jews, they were ripe for the gospel. The gospel of grace. And so, enter Jesus Christ, and as I said until this point, his his uh, teaching had been limited to just a few. But he's now in Galilee, 
we could divide the ministry of Jesus up into three parts, really. His early Galilean ministry, and that's where we are as we begin the Sermon on the Mount. The early Galilean ministry, and then later he goes down into Judea, and ministers in Judea, goes to the city of Jerusalem and ministers there. Then he goes back to, some time later, goes back to Galilee for his later Galilean ministry, and then back down one more time into Judea where he enters Jerusalem for the final time and is crucified. Now, you remember his, in his early Galilean ministry, as he begins to minister, it's in Galilee where Jesus performs his first miracle. You remember that was at this, the wedding feast of Cana where he turns the water into wine. So he's beginning to perform miracles. And um, Isaiah would prophesy that this is where Jesus would begin his teaching. Isaiah said that the people, listen to this, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, Isaiah said, light has dawned. Jesus is the light that Isaiah was prophesying about. And light steps on the stage of humanity. John, John's Gospel, he would write it this way. Jesus was the true light, capital L, L-I-G-H-T. Jesus was the true light to every man coming into the world. John chapter 1. But now in Matthew 5, in this one powerful comprehensive message, which covers Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Lord set forth the foundational truths concerning the kingdom of heaven. And that's an important phrase because it's used 30 times in Matthew's gospel alone. About 100 times in the New Testament. The kingdom of heaven. We read it over and over and over again. So with that as our background, let's begin reading now in chapter 4, verse 23. It says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, which is today modern-day Turkey. And they brought to him with uh, all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demonic or demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics. And the Bible says he healed them. Verse 25, we note that great multitudes now followed Jesus from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. And seeing the multitudes, Jesus went up on a mountain. Now, that would be more like a hilltop. We wouldn't think of the Ozark Mountains, but he went up on a hilltop. Can you imagine in those days speaking to thousands of people in your natural voice? And Jesus goes up on this hilltop. Undoubtedly so that he can be heard by more people. And he opened his mouth and taught them saying, by, uh, by the way, I missed an important phrase. When he was seated, his disciples came to him. So here's the setting. Jesus is on this mountain, this hilltop. And sitting underneath him, close to him, are his disciples. And we know that Jesus was seated. He sat down while he taught. Now, in the contemporary church, I've tried this before, and Carla's encouraged me. Why don't you try sitting while you speak on Sunday mornings? It'll portray a more casual atmosphere. And, and uh, sometimes my back hurts so badly, I wish I did have a high stool up here to sit on. But I'm not comfortable sitting while I preach. I just, just couldn't get comfortable with that. But it is fairly common today in the contemporary church for the speaker to sit. And it is a sign of a relaxed culture, a casual atmosphere, but not in Jesus' day. When the rabbis taught, 
those who were highly respected by the Jews, did you know they sat and they talked? So Jesus does exactly what the rabbis do. He sits. He begins to teach. Because he is the true authority. And he begins to teach and he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when you are reviled and, and they persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I want to pray this morning as we begin this series and ask God's blessings upon it. Father, we depend upon you now to teach. And would you speak through this man standing in front of these people who all of us so desperately need to hear the truth of this sermon over the coming weeks? Would you guide our thoughts and comments? Would you just capture our minds and our attention this morning as we study the Word and use it for your glory, our good, and the salvation of the lost. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now guys, the question that we need to ask is how do we approach the sermon? I've already alluded to this. About the law. We need to remember that Christ, He left no wiggle room, if you will, for His understanding of the law. Jesus told us that he had not come to cancel the law, nor the teachings of the prophet, he said, but to fulfill it. So we're not looking now at teaching of the teachings of the Lord that cancels the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God. Jesus said, I've come to fulfill it. And yet at the same time, if we had the Greek manuscript in front of us of Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and we read it in the Greek, we would discover no less than 50 imperatives in these three chapters. 50 commandments given by the Lord in these chapters. So, is this a legal treatise? Is Jesus teaching what people must do? Or what commands or laws they must keep in order to gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven? Is that what he's teaching? And there are those who say yes to that question. Well, I disagree. I want us to see that this morning, I want us to see that Christ's teaching in the sermon doesn't command people to do this or that in order to enter the kingdom or even to remain in the kingdom. What I want us to see is that Christ is teaching in these teachings, Christ describes life in the kingdom. Christ, in other words, is not teaching or not trying to show people what they must do in order to get into the kingdom. He is showing or describing what life looks like for people who are already in the kingdom. If you're in the kingdom of heaven, this is what your life will look like. Now Matthew's very careful in his choice of words. He speaks of the words of Christ to the disciples, those in the kingdom, those of, who are already his disciples. In the context of the work of Christ for the disciples, Matthew's very careful in his wording. He's careful to show us that entrance into the kingdom is only by grace. So he's inviting the readers to see 
the demands of Christ in the context of the gift of Christ. So Jesus' main goal in the sermon is not simply to declare laws, even laws for disciples. Rather, he describes the disciples' way of life under his authority. For those who are in the kingdom and under the authority of Christ, they will respond rightly to the law and love the law. So that's the first thing we need to understand this morning. Jesus is showing us what kingdom life looks like. Not how to get into the kingdom, but what it looks like when you're in the kingdom. Now the audience. The context clearly shows that the sermon is primarily targeted to those who are disciples. We notice two things in Matthew 4, 17 through 22. What, did he, he was, what was he doing? We didn't read 17, but if you go back and look at 17, it says, From the time Jesus began to preach and teach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then in verse 18, what does he do? He starts calling his disciples. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting their net into the sea, and they were fishermen. And then he said to them, Follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. And he goes on and he sees two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother. And he calls them and makes them his disciples. So we already see that he's gathering his disciples. And he's proclaiming the coming of his kingdom. My kingdom, the kingdom of heaven has come. And now he's describing life in the kingdom. And he needs to ensure that people follow him for the right reasons. And secondly, Jesus fills his sermon. He just fills up the sermon with indication that he's addressing his disciples, men and women who are already in the kingdom. All right? Now, we read in chapter 5, and we're going to look at these over the next few weeks, the Beatitudes. You grew up in, if you grew up in Sunday school, you were taught these Beatitudes. Maybe some of you Memorize the Beatitudes. In verse 3, Jesus began by blessing those who know their need for God's grace. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And each of these Beatitudes begins with that word, blessed. 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 And so it's important that we understand what that word means. So that we can properly interpret what Jesus is saying. Now, I want to be careful here because there are a lot of good people who say and agree that the word blessed can be translated, or is translated here, happy. I don't think so. I don't think that's the exact proper translation in this context. The Greek word can be translated happy, a subjective state of being. Sometimes I'm happy, sometimes I'm sad. And I guess we could force the issue that those who are in Christ and under His great uh, domain and under His great grace certainly are happy people most of the time. But I think this word is better translated in its objective state or statement where God is saying something objective about those people who are in the kingdom. I think what He is declaring here is a positive judgment on the individual that means to be approved. We could say, approved of God are those who are poor in spirit. I think that's the better translation. So we could say, approved of God are the poor in spirit. Approved of God are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. In other words, those who are in the kingdom true disciples are blessed with God's approval, His stamp of approval. We found approval. Max Licato, this great inspirational writer, wrote a book several years ago called The Applause of Heaven. And in that book, the title is referring to this word blessed, that because we're blessed of God, approved of God, Lakato says, we have the applause of heaven. 
What a wonderful thing to consider this morning. And when your name comes up in heaven, there's great applause. Hey, that's Richard. He's in the kingdom. Well, he's a child of God. We get the applause of heaven, the approval of God. And we alluded to this last Sunday when I asked you, you know, when you consider God, when you think of God, what do you think of? Do you think of a God who is moody, angry sometimes at you? Or do you think of a God who is happy? This morning, do you think of a God when he, who thinks of you? He thinks, I'm a, I approve of Hutch, Hutcherson. I approve of Carla Hall. I approve of Josh Parker. They're in Christ. They're my children approved of God. God is smiling upon us, as Max Lucado says. We have the smile of God upon our lives. And he tells his disciples that they are already in the kingdom of life, and they have the benefits that belong to those who are in Christ. And when he blesses the poor in spirit and the persecuted, he adds this in chapter 5, verses 3 and 10, for theirs is, he says, theirs is, the kingdom of heaven. Now why is this so important that we get this right? Because Jesus, he's a, he assumes these people are, that they're, that are sitting before him, these are his disciples. And they need to know the truth about righteousness. There's a truth about righteousness that is contrary to the teachings of the Pharisees of their days. And Jesus wants those in the kingdom to understand that what he is looking for is a righteousness that what? Flows out of the heart. See, there's a transformation on the inside first. And then true righteousness, love of the law, flows out of the heart. The Pharisees had it backwards. Their righteousness was an external righteousness. They looked the part. The people looked at the Pharisees. They dressed part and they acted the part most of the time in public but it wasn't a righteousness that flowed from the heart and so this is important for us to get this so we li when we, we listen to Jesus we as his people strive to obey him not in order to gain entry into the kingdom but to live faithfully in the kingdom that's why these words are so important to us over the next coming week but we do see that there were unbelievers present. Today we might call these people seekers. They, they were present. Matthew 4.25 said great multitudes followed him. We know on at least two occasions up to 5,000 people. And on another occasion 4,000 people sat at his feet while he was teaching them. Now notice after Jesus called his disciples to himself, 5, 1 through 2, members of the crowd filtered in behind him. And when he finished his teaching, and oh, we'll see this when we come to the end of chapter 7, what does it say when the sermon was finished? What did Matthew say? The people were amazed. The crowds were amazed because he taught as one having authority. Now this morning, as we kind of bring it to a summary close, I want us to see that the Sermon on the Mount is gospel-centered. Uh, let me make a statement that you might hear me make over and over again in this series. Brothers and sisters, the Bible teaches us to see history as completely dominated by Jesus Christ. The Christian worldview is not simply defined by mere dogma. And we, but we, we do have dogma. We do have declarations, firm declarations, and laws of God and truths of God. We do have that. But it's not defined only by that dogma. It's defined by the person, Jesus Christ. In John 14, Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. And so when we think of our worldview and our 
youth are looking at this on Wednesday nights and they're getting into this issue of world view. And when we think of world view, we, we ask the questions concerning our origin and our meaning in this life and what does the future hold for us. Those are the questions that have, men have pondered since creation. How did I get here? And why am I here? And is there anything after this life? And Jesus answers that question. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And in the Sermon on the Mount, we'll find that it's gospel-centered and that Christ is the good news of the kingdom. He's the good news of the gospel. The good news is a person called Jesus Christ. And the path to the gospel Paul affirmed this path. Paul tells us that God, listen to this, God ultimately satisfies that desire through Christ by granting us, what? His righteousness. That's how the gospel works. So as we close this morning, let's look at a few ways that the gospel is in the Sermon on the Mount. Well, first of all, Jesus' disciples, as we've said, are His primary audience. And they know about grace. He begins his sermon with approved of God, blessed are the poor in spirit. And to be poor in spirit is to know one's spiritual bankruptcy. To know that I have no hope. I have nothing to offer. But Jesus Christ and his righteousness. That's the believer's response to Christ's teaching. Only through Christ. Can I measure up? Now the unbeliever will respond to the sermon in one of two ways. There will be a foolish optimism, prideful view, a prideful approach like the pride of the Pharisees. I can do this. Or there will be hopeless despair. There's no way I can measure up. I can't do it. The other alternative is to come humbly and poor in spirit before the Lord and recognize our spiritual bankrupt, bankruptcy. See, only a believer, a child of God, can rightly respond to the high standards that Jesus is setting in this Sermon on the Mount. And our first response to the questions, like the questions that will come later, hard questions, like the question, for example, of adultery. You shall not commit adultery. You've heard that it's been said. You shall not commit adultery. And our first response will be, well, I've got that one okay. I'm okay over there. And then we realize the truth. I'm also guilty of that sin. Yes, even me. The truth comes out. Because it's an issue of the heart, Jesus would say. I love what John Stott wrote about this. He said, we can never reach Christ's standards. Rather, we give evidence of what, by God's free grace and gift, we already are. You know what he's saying? We already are, by God's grace, approved, blessed. So as Jesus describes his high standards for discipleship, we have to ask the question, ask for the ability to obey and mercy when we fall short. So this points us to the second example. The sermon encourages listeners to turn to Jesus for grace. And they see their inability to obey Him. In, in this sermon with just surgical precision, Jesus lays open every man and woman's heart. He opens up the heart. Can my poor deeds shine brightly enough that they bring glory to God? Can my righteousness, can my external observance of the law exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees? Can I avoid all anger and lust? And since we can't, Jesus bids us to ask for His grace. And He says, ask and it shall be given to you. That is, God will give you the grace you need 
Thirdly, Jesus ends his message. When he ends his message, he invites people to come to God. And he gives these four analogies in chapter 7. We'll study these. There are two roads, he says. There's a narrow road and a wide road. There are many that go down the wide road, and it's a road that leads to destruction. The narrow road, it's hard. It's difficult. But it means one has to admit he or she is spiritually bankrupt and in need of Jesus Christ. And then he talks about two trees that bear fruit. He said a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, neither can a bad tree bear good fruit. And then people call on Jesus in two ways. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons? And Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. See, some of the people closest to hell sit in church pews every Sunday. And then there's this analogy of the builders. Do you remember this? There were two builders, one who built on the sand and one who built on the rock. And the rock was Jesus. And then finally, the sermon leads us to Christ and His gospel by virtue of its location in Matthew's gospel. The Jesus who fulfills the law gives his life as a ransom for those who would follow him and love him. Matthew shows us that Jesus was willing to pay for the sins of both moral and immoral people. People who work hard at obedience and people who do not work at all. I mentioned in my introduction that if we had the Greek reading in front of us, we would see no less than 50 imperatives. Guys, without the gospel, we are left only with the heavy burden of those imperatives. But thankfully, this sermon, as we will see in the coming weeks, leads us to the gospel. And there are burdens are lifted. It's a great place to have communion, isn't it? When we consider that our burdens are lifted at the cross through the mercy of God and the work of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask our elders to come forward now as we prepare to dispense the sacrament this morning. We'll give you an opportunity to prepare yourself. Let's make this a time of celebration today as we remember the gospel that we've spoken about this morning. And that all of these laws that we will read about, the teachings that Jesus will teach to us over the coming weeks will be good news to us. It will be words that will refresh us because we've been brought into the kingdom of heaven by the work of Jesus Christ. So bless His name for that. Father, we thank You for these elements that are before us this morning. Something that we can take and in a tangible, physical way be reminded of the gospel of grace. As we take this bread, we drink this juice this morning, we're reminded that Jesus had to give of Himself totally. He had to give of Himself physically. He had to die on a cross, suffer the agony, the pain of the cross. But it, but it wasn't so much the fact that Jesus suffered that pain on the cross as it is the fact that He did die. He did go to the cross. The Son of God, pure, completely without sin, and spilled His blood so that we might be brought into the kingdom of heaven and be blessed today. Thank you that we have your approval through Christ and that we really are yours. And you really do find joy when you think of us and you consider us. 
and that even now, who knows, maybe in heaven, there's great applause going on for the people of hope who are in Christ. And we thank you for this truth that shapes our life here and the one to come. In Jesus' name, amen. The old scripture says that that day in the upper room, that evening, Jesus took bread and he broke it. He gave the bread to his disciples and said, Take eat, for this is my body given for you. After they had broken bread together, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks for it, offered it to his disciples and said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. And praise God to you for the forgiveness of sins. A couple of things before we leave today. One, um, we are still taking pictures. Lee will be taking pictures in the room this morning after you leave. So we're trying to get everything updated so we can launch this new digital directory. So you'd like your picture made, Lee is available this morning. Pray for the elders as we meet this afternoon and pray for Sean and his family this week as they uh, remember his mother on Tuesday. Stand with me and uh, let's go this morning with the Lord's blessings. And I pray that the grace and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit will go with you all. Amen.